the man said to her, Come on, just get over it already. Just forget about it. It's not a big deal. Come on, move on. Anyone ever said something like that to you? Kind of kicked you while you were down, it felt like? That's what happens when, when someone says that, right? If someone says something like that, it, it never, never turns out well. Because even if they don't mean to come across that way, maybe they don't, but it feels like they're saying, your fear, it doesn't matter. Your concern, it's unfounded. And the person to whom that thing is being said, they feel invalidated, they feel rejected, they feel alone. It's not, it's not good. And sometimes it might feel like that. It might feel like that when God says some things to you. It might feel like God is saying to you, get over it already. But I promise you today, he is not. He does not simply shout at you and say, get over it. There's going to be a point in our section of scripture for today when you probably feel at least a little bit like God is saying that to you. But again, I promise he's not. Our section for today is Philippians 4, verses 4 through 9. And we're going to look at these words throughout the sermon this morning. This section, it's like a a high-octane game of ping-pong going back and forth between commands that God has given us to do and promises for us about things that God has done or is doing or will do or all three. So, We're going to jump right in. We're going to just look at here at the beginning, verses 4 and 5. Here we go. Philippians 4. It says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Now, gentleness is this. Not insisting on every right of the letter of the law or custom. And a commentator applied it to Christians this way. He said, Christians ought to be people who would much rather suffer wrong than inflict it. Where others loudly demand their rights, believers will gladly yield theirs. And the principle here is, if you're rejoicing in the Lord, you're going to have this kind of gentleness. You just are. If you're rejoicing in the Lord, you're not going to insist on things. You're not going to need things to turn out just exactly the way you want them to be. You're going to be okay if you get mistreated. You're going to be all right with being treated unfairly. You're not going to insist on things being a certain way. You're not going to insist on your rights because you have everything you need. Because you have joy in in the Lord very specific joy, and it can never be taken away. How? Why? Because of the promise at the end of verse 5. It says, the Lord is near. He is near. He is next to you all the time. Even when it feels or it seems like he is distant or far off, I promise, he promises more importantly, he is near. He always, he always is. And in fact, He is near to you because he has brought you near to him in his own gentleness. Yeah, our Lord is full of gentleness. He is willing, he is more willing to suffer pain. He would rather do that than inflict it. And this is exactly what Jesus did. He was willing to be gentle. He was willing to suffer pain. He was willing to give up his rights He didn't demand them. He was willing to give up his right to a fair trial. His right not to be executed. His right as true God not to come down from the cross, even though he surely could have. He was willing not to punish you and me for our sins, even though that would have been justice. That would have been what we deserved. He was willing to give up all these rights and more so that you and I would have the right to live with him forever in heaven. He was willing to have suffering inflicted on him 
so that you and I, yeah, we might suffer for a time here on earth, but we would not have suffering inflicted on us forever. The Lord, our Savior Jesus, he has unlimited gentleness and he is always near to you because he has brought you near to him. The promise. The Lord is near right now. And then we ping across the net all of a sudden. And this is the one. This is the one where you're thinking, is God saying, get over it? He's not, though. Verse 6, he says, do not be anxious about anything. And perhaps, especially if, if you're an anxious person or you're dealing with anxiety right now, or you've been riddled with it and you've battled with it in the past, right now, perhaps, you're thinking, what? How? It sure seems like God is yelling, get over it, but it's not. It's him saying, don't be anxious. You don't have to be. But, and if you are, here's what you can do. Here's what you should do. Verse 6 continues, do not be anxious about anything, but... In every situation, every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. When you're anxious, when anxiety is coming at you, God says, what you do? Pray. Talk to him. Set your anxiety at his feet. And petitions, it's a specific kind of prayer. A petition is an urgent request to God to fulfill one of your needs. And then he says, do this all with thanksgiving. Thankfulness. It is a wonderful, wonderful thing. I'll say it this way. You ever meet a person who's a big jerk and is also incredibly thankful? You ever meet a person who is always angry at the world or angry at you, who also has this incredible air of thankfulness around them? No, you don't. It's kind of the way it is. Thankfulness and joy go together. Now, this is not a promise, but it's a principle. It's not a promise, but things like gratitude journals, or even just sitting back, closing your eyes and saying, okay, what are three things I'm thankful for? It's not a promise that things are going to be made better, but it is a good thing to do. God commands it. Pray, bring petitions with thanksgiving. Now this week, I talked with a counselor about all this stuff. And this counselor said that when it comes to anxiety, one of the things that um, he does with people who are battling anxiety, they work on something called cognitive coping skills or cognitive coping tools. And what this is, is it's a skill or a tool to use in connection with your cognition um, in order to cope with or in order to work through the anxiety. And cognition just has to do with your thinking. So it's something that you do to think. And this counselor, he said, prayer is one of these things. It's a thing involving your cognition. You're using your mind. And he says, because when you pray, you're taking the focus off of the thing that is riddling you with anxiety. It's taking the focus off of how you feel, and it's putting the focus on God and his promises. Prayer in the world of counseling is a cognitive coping tool. And God designed it this way because he's the one who designed prayer. He created it and he created us. He designed our brains to work this way. A cognitive coping tool, prayer. Don't be anxious. When you are, and you will be, pray. And now, back to the other side of the net, again, we get a promise. Verse 7, And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, it will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. This means you won't necessarily understand what's going on. In fact, you won't. Not in your own body or in your brain or out in the world. But you don't need to understand in order to have peace. That's what this means. God's peace will transcend all understanding. It goes above and beyond. God has created perfect 
harmony between you and him. This is what we talked about earlier with him giving up his rights, him willing to have suffering inflicted on us. He has created perfect peace. He holds nothing against you. And even if you don't understand anything else, this is the truth. And it will guard your hearts and your minds because no matter what else is going on, that peace is always, always there. And this is not a conditional promise. It's not a, well, if you persistently pray, if you really bring your petitions to God, then he'll give you peace. No, this is unconditional. God has already created this harmony. It already exists between you and him. It's not dependent on you in any way, which is good news. That's a promise. And now, this is really quick, isn't it? Another command, another principle in verse 8. God says, well, Paul says, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Why is God telling you what to do? Because it's good for you. All his commands are, every single one of them, he gives it to you, not because it would be bad for you or because you'd be missing out if you did something different. He gives you his commands because they're good for you and they're an opportunity for you to honor him by following them. So, everything that you allow into your brain, it affects you. This is, this is reasonable, right? Everything you allow into your brain affects you. Because everything you allow into your brain eventually comes out of you, and in between it coming in and going out, what does it do? It affects you. So, this is for you, you, the one watching this or listening to this right now. Do a detailed analysis of your thoughts. What are you thinking about on a regular basis, throughout the day, throughout the week? What are you allowing into your brain? And then ask these questions. Is it true? Is it noble? That means, does it evoke respect? Is it right? It means, is it just? Is it pure? Is it without moral defect? Is it lovely? Does it cause delight? And I'm losing track here on my fingers. Is it admirable? Let's get specific for a minute. Do you admire the things that you watch on television? Whether it's the news, or commentary, or movies, or whatever. Do you admire it? When you look at Facebook, or Twitter, or Instagram, or Snapchat, or TikTok, or Pinterest even, are those things that you're looking at, are they admirable? Are they pure? Are they right? Are they true? Are they noble? Are they excellent or praiseworthy? God is saying, if the answer to those questions is no, then don't think about it. Don't watch that on television. If it's not these things, if it's not any of these things, or if it's not one of these things, don't look at it on your phone or on the computer. Don't give it the time of day. If the answer is no to these questions or any of these questions, stop it. Cut it out. Don't look at it. Don't think about it. Don't let it in your head. But if the answer is yes, well then, by all means, let it in. Use your time. Devote your time to it. Give your time to it. But again, if the answer is no, stop it. But you know, you know what is all these things? God. <laughs> he is truth. Everything he says. He is noble. He evokes the most respect. He is right. He is always just. He is pure. There is no moral defect in him. He is admirable beyond admiration. He is lovely. Everything about him, his mercy, his unconditional love, his ability to forgive, even as we all struggle to forgive, we struggle to let things go and not hold things against people. We want to hold on to the right 
to have something owed to us. We don't want to let that debt go. But God, he's perfectly forgiving. He is admirable in, in, his, in his creative power, in his design ability. Like, he fashioned everything, everything you see and everything you don't even see. He made it. He created it. He designed it. He fashioned everything. Or he fashioned the people to whom he gave the ability to fashion other things, which is maybe even more incredible. Like, God designed people who figured out light bulbs and motherboards and nuclear power reactors and coffee. God is excellent and praiseworthy, the most excellent, the most praiseworthy. So if you're wondering about, should I be thinking about this thing or not? Is it, is it excellent, praiseworthy, good, right, pure, lovely? You know, just think about God. And I guarantee you'll be good to go. And now, it's the last verse. And this last verse, Paul again, he goes back and forth. We get kind of a catch-all command and then one final promise. Here's verse 9. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen into me, whatever it is, put it into practice. And then the promise. And the God of peace will be with you. God promises. He will be. He is right now with you. No matter what is in your head, in your body, whether it's joy or anxiety or a mixture of both, he is with you. No matter your, your health situation, whether it is amazing or it's really poor and you're kind of nervous about the future and you've got a lot of pain, he is with you. No matter the situation in your community or in your world or in your household, whether it's wonderful or horrible, whether you love it or you don't like it at all, no matter what, the God of peace is with you always. And I'm going to say amen in just a minute. But before I do, I've got to give you instructions. If you're watching this on video, there's a bunch of text right below this video, an exercise for you to do. There's promises at the beginning and the end and in the middle. There's three things. Three things, and I want you to actually write these down, do these right after you watch this video. Three things in regard to gentleness and anxiety and such things. Three takeaways. So write these down. This week, with regard to gentleness, what right of yours, you could hold on to it, but what right of yours are you going to give up? Write it down. In regard to anxiety, what is it right now that is weighing on your soul? What is causing you anxiety? What are you battling with? Take it to the Lord in prayer. Lay it at his feet because he cares for you. And in regard to such things, what is it that this week you're going to strive not to think about? What is it that you are not going to take in because it is not true or noble or right or pure or lovely or admirable or excellent or praiseworthy? What are you not going to take in this week? And on the flip side, what are you going to think more about? Think about those things. Write down answers to all those questions. And as you do that, and in every moment of your life, God promises, he the God of peace will be with you. Amen.